as we go to open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach us your statutes. With our lips we declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies we delight as much as in all riches. So help us to meditate on your precepts and fix our eyes on your ways. Then we know we will delight in your statutes and we will not forget your word. We ask that you would deal bountifully with your servants that we may live and keep your word. And ask that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your scriptures. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon chapter 4. If you're visiting with us, we've been considering a series through the book of the Song of Solomon. and We've come to chapter 4, verse 8. Chapter 4, verse 8. Um, the book of Song of Solomon is after Ecclesiastes and before Isaiah in the Old Testament. It's one of the books of wisdom literature. And we've been considering a series through it. We've come to chapter 4, verse 8. We want to read uh, verse 8 through chapter 5, verse 1 and consider what the Spirit has to say to the church. So chapter 4 of Song of Solomon, verse 8, beginning there and reading through chapter 5, verse 1. And let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions and from the, approach, from the mountains of leopards. You have captivated my heart. My sister, my bride, you have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all choice spices. A garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Um, as we've been considering through this book, we've, we've noticed something of the structure of it. Uh, we talked about that at the very beginning of our, of our text. But one of the things we find often in Hebrew poetry is that the center is, the, is where you find the core of the meaning. Uh, sometimes when we look at Psalms, it's helpful to see that, that the central part of the psalm is often where you find the meaning really exposed um, and the same is true of this song as Hebrew poetry. Uh, it's, a, it's a reminder that the Holy Spirit is an artist. Uh, he's not just a conveyor of truth. I think in the Reformed Church, we're good at you know, thinking heady thoughts about truth and propositions about theology. But we should not lose sight of the fact that the Holy Spirit is an artist, that God is a wonderful painter of pictures. And the Holy Spirit has put together this song to teach wisdom about how to love and has carefully structured this psalm so that we find the center of this psalm really in chapter 4 verse 16 through verse through chapter 5 verse 1 that is the structural center of the song of solomon before that center there are 111 lines of poetry and after this center there are 111 lines of poetry it helps us to see that this is the functional center of the book. And so in many ways, this is one of the most important parts of the text that we've come to as we've considered this song together, because we find here this structural center that ties the whole song together. Um, and so what is the focus that the book comes to here? What is the focus that we find? Um, it's the consummation of the marriage between the husband and the wife. 
And that really shouldn't surprise us that the center of a song about how to love, the center of a song about marriage, finds its focal point, its center point in consummation. Uh, That word is an important word for us. It means to bring to completion or to fulfillment. Um, In our culture, unfortunately, it's hard to use that word in any other sense than to mean sexual intimacy. That's if you ever ask talk about consummating a marriage, that's what people, their minds immediately go to. But we're using consummation in that broader term, that term that has a very important meaning for the Christian community. Uh, Because we are waiting for the consummation of the kingdom of God. Um, We are waiting for its fulfillment. We are waiting for it to be brought to completion. That is the Christian hope. Uh, We know that Christ is king now. We celebrate that our Lord Jesus has triumphed by his death, by his resurrection. He's ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of his Father. He is ruling and reigning now. It's very important that we know that, right? That we we function like that in our minds. To know we are not waiting for a king. We have a king. What we are waiting for is not a kingdom, but the consummation of the kingdom. The kingdom that's been inaugurated, we're waiting for that kingdom to be brought to fulfillment, to be brought to completion. That's why the chief of the prayers of the church is, come Lord Jesus. Because at his coming, the church is brought to its fulfillment. The church and the mission of the kingdom of God is brought to its consummation, its completion. Um, That's when the kingdom of grace that has been begun in this world, that's been inaugurated by the resurrection and the ascension and the session of our Lord, will become the kingdom of glory. Um, It's that kingdom that's already begun, that's already been inaugurated. The king is already on his throne, but it's not yet complete. It's not yet fulfilled. Um, And part of the reason for that is there are still sheep that are part of the church. There are citizens that are a part of the kingdom that have yet to be called in. And it makes sense to us to think that the kingdom cannot be complete without all of its subjects being gathered into it. And it cannot be complete until our king is among us. And that's what we're looking forward to. That's the hope of the Christian church. That's the glory that awaits the people of God. Um, It's broader in that sense. That term is so important for us to think of the consummation of the kingdom that is coming soon with the return of our Lord, when the kingdom that's been inaugurated has been consummated. And as we see this couple that are in love, that have been speaking about their love for one another, and we considered their marriage last time, the consummation of their marriage is much more than simply a physical union. This is the fulfillment and the completion of everything they've hoped for in a life together, in being brought together as husband and wife and being able to go forward together in their lives. Um, And what this is reminding us is that the completion, the fulfillment of this kind of relationship cannot happen apart from that covenant commitment. This is one of the really helpful things that we see in this wisdom literature about how to love, is that there is a commitment that is, that is intended to be attached to these powerful desires and these wonderful physical gifts that the Lord has given. It's not meant to happen apart from the covenant commitment that God requires. Um, and that runs counterculture to what our culture would say right now. Um, that desires can be indulged in apart from commitment. Um, And it goes with a whole kind of worldview. If we're all just grown-up animals and animals are instinctive creatures, then it stands to reason that we just indulge our instincts like animals, Um, that we really don't have to be committed to marriage. We don't have to have any concept of that. We can just sort of do whatever we want to do. And we are the weirdos in the world who think that marriage is important and that waiting until marriage is important. It runs totally counter to the world and what it says about these things. Um, The world comes and says, if you wait like that, you're missing out on a garden of delights that could be enjoyed. And what this wisdom literature comes and says is actually, no, Uh, that's not the case. There is actually a glory 
to waiting for the consummation of a relationship, including that physical aspect, until all of it is consummated in that marriage. That that's where love finds its fulfillment. That's where it finds its completion between husband and wife in that covenant commitment. And that's what really our text tonight is teaching us and helping us to see, as one commentator put it, that love begins with commitment and no true love is possible without it. This is hardly the beginning of their commitment to one another. We've seen that all along. But this is the consummation of what they've been hoping for in their love and in their lives together. And that's what this text is really about. The consummation of love in the context of the covenant commitment of marriage. And we could really break it down into three stanzas or verses. uh, Three wonderful pictures that are painted for us here. We have the picture of desire in verses 8 through 11. We have the picture of delights in verses 12 through 15, and we have the picture of enjoyment at that structural center of the song in verses 16 through 5-1. And that's what we want to, how we want to think about it together tonight. So first, this picture of desire that verses 8 through 11 paint for us, uh, the first thing we should notice is that these are the words of the husband to his bride. Um, maybe we, we read right over it. In our, in our reading, maybe you thought we've been talking about these people for so long. I mean, I already think of them as husband and bride. I don't know that I really pause to reflect on that. But if you look at chapter 4, verse 8, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. That's the first time he calls her that. Uh, maybe those of you who are married can remember getting married and then sort of for the first time have to, having to think of someone as your husband or to think of being someone's wife. Uh, to think in those kinds of terms. And that's what happens here. This is the first time he's addressing his bride. Um, And that word bride appears six more times in this section. And it appears nowhere else in the book. Uh, There's a focus being brought here on this marital relationship that they have with one another. Um, It signals that they've reached a key turning point in their relationship. Uh, She's no longer just his beloved, his darling. She is now his bride. Uh, She's still his beloved, but she's now also his beloved and his bride. That's a key turning point in their relationship. That new bond has been forged, that familial bond of marriage. And as they enter into this relationship with one another, the husband is calling on his bride to do two things. The first thing he's calling on her to do here is to leave the realm of inaccessibility and distance that has characterized their relationship to this point. Uh, This is one of those things that is hard for us because geographic locations in the Bible are unfamiliar to us. Um, Unless you're a better uh, geographically on the Bible than I am, you don't have a clearly in your mind where uh, Lebanon is, and even if you know where Lebanon is, you probably don't know where the peak of Amana is or Sanir, or Herman. Um, You don't even know if those are the right ways to pronounce it. You don't even know if you can trust me on that. Um, It's always good when you get to words like that just to read over them and don't go back. Uh, Read them and don't go back. So if you're reading to your children, you're reading your Bibles out loud, you hit a word like this, you don't know how to pronounce it, read it once and keep going. I guarantee if you stop to go back, it's going to be disaster from there on. We don't know where any of these places are, right? Um, But from their perspective, from the perspective of Solomon, from the perspective of Israel, these are all faraway places. These would all be places they would consider to represent great distance. And so what does the call from the husband to the wife sound like? These are places that are far away and places that are inaccessible. Largely places that we couldn't go. I like sometimes reading books about mountaineering, and when I first started reading them, my mom became very nervous that I was going to go mountaineering. She had not raised me to watch me freeze to death on some 8,000-meter peak, and I assured her I liked reading about them. I was not intending to go do it. Uh, But you read about these really inaccessible places, right? Uh, These difficult peaks to climb like Mount Everest or K2. That's the kind of mountain that's being talked about here, places that would have represented inaccessibility, places that you can't go and that you can't get to. And that sense of inaccessibility is increased when you list all these place names and then you call them the den of lions and the mountains of leopards. Right? These are places that you can't get to and that you don't want to go. 
Um, I saw a video this week about a woman who got way too close to a bison in Yellowstone, and everybody was talking about it. And then as part of the article I read, they said, you know, they recommend that you stay 25 yards away from bison and 100 yards away from wolves. And I thought, I'm sorry, but if you need to be told to stay away from a wolf, you have a lot of problems. Um, I want to be more than 100 yards away from wolves. That's not where I want to go. I don't want to be where the wolves are. You can write that down as just wisdom for life, not wisdom for love, but just wisdom for life, right? And that's, what, that's why by mentioning dens of lions, mountains of leopards, what is he doing? He's saying those are places that are far away. Those are places that are inaccessible. Those are places you don't want to go. And what is he calling her to do? To leave those places and to come with him. Uh, to a new place together, uh, to a place that he describes as a garden world together. Uh, The intimacy of that marriage, he's contrasting the distance and the inaccessibility that has characterized where they've been to this point to the intimacy and the relationship of closeness that they can now enjoy. The call is urgent, the call is passionate, right? There's no doubting that as you read through it. Um, It's a passionate desire for her, but this passion and this call is filled with care, it's filled with respect, it's filled with self-giving. He doesn't say these things to manipulate her or to worse coerce her. He paints this picture of desire in such a way that she can be sure that he is entirely devoted to her and only to her, right? Sex is not his ultimate object here. Uh, Life with her intimacy with her in all of its ways is what he's looking for. One person said, pursuing love and marriage is by definition a journey into the unknown. So on that risky journey into the unforeseeable future, what counts most is the man's enduring and committed presence with her. He's saying regardless of where we end up on the journey, you will be with me. Right? That's how he starts in verse 8 that she would be with him. Um, That's what he wants her to understand, that he's calling her to be with someone who loves her, who wants nothing more than to be with her. And his commitment to her is communicated in in lots of wonderful ways in verse 9. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Right, that he's completely smitten with her. Um, it's a way of saying, you know, you leave me breathless, you drive me crazy, you've stolen my heart. He's completely taken by her. Um, one glance of your eyes is enough to leave me breath- breathless. One little link of your necklace makes me weak in the knees. Just watching it glitter drives me crazy, right? He's really pouring it on in this sense about how he feels about her. And in verses 10 and 11, he mirrors the kinds of things that she has said to him before. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your lips drip nectar, my bride. Honey and milk are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Um, That mirrors what she had said to him in, Solom- in, the, in the song back in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out, therefore virgins love you. So there's similar things that are being said in verse 10 to what she'd said before to him to assure her that he feels about her the way that she feels about him. And then he sort of elevates it all in verse 11, primarily with, these senses of fragrance and taste. That goes back and forth in this section as the dominant themes here uh, to show the sweetness of her to him. Um, Right, Honey and milk under her tongue. Uh, What what was Canaan when it was described as a wonderful land? It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. Those are good things. And he's saying that's what her speech is to him, under her tongue, um, delightful for its wisdom and its grace. Um, Everything about her, he loves. Um, It's involving all of the senses to kind of complete this picture of just how much he is completely taken by her. He's really putting all of his cards on the table, isn't he? He's he's really opening up his heart to her. 
uh, to reveal those things. Um, and it leaves you pretty exposed to open up your heart like that to someone. And it's something you don't do unless you really love them and trust them. Uh, that's what is also being pictured us to us here. To open himself up to her so completely is a measure of how much he trusts her. Uh, how much he thinks of her. Um, and she, he, want, he does this because he wants her to be sure that she knows that. But it's one of the difficulties that we, we, don't, we can't know the hearts of people, right? The only way we can learn what's in someone's heart is if they let us see it. Um, we can't just assume people will know, right? It's important to tell people things so that they understand them. And that's what he's doing for her. He's opening out his heart so that she will know as they go forward together into what will be for both of them the unknown, uh, so that she will know one thing for sure, just how much he loves her and how much he is committed to her in their life together, that she doesn't have to fear to come away with him uh, into the unknown, even to the marital bed, because there's nothing he desires more than her and to be with her forever. Um, we see his care for her in this, don't we? as they're entering into this new life together, no longer as his beloved fiance, but as his beloved bride. Uh, this is one of the ways that husbands can love their wives as Christ loves the church. Um, Jesus bends over backwards that we might know his heart for the church. It'd be a terrible thing if we didn't know how Jesus really felt about us. Right? It'd be a terrible thing if we thought maybe, just maybe, the Father loves us, and Jesus is doing what the Father told him to do, but I'm not sure how Jesus feels about me. Um, I'm not sure if he loves me. That would be a terrible thing. And so what does Jesus do? He, in many ways, opens out his heart to us so that his church would know just how much he loves and cares for the church. One of the great places where Jesus opens his heart to us in the way, is in the way that he prays to his father in John 17. Um, that's a good place to go if you want to see Jesus talking to his father about us and seeing what he thinks of us and what he desires for us. Right? Jesus opens his heart to his church so that his church would know his love for us. Uh, in a sense, we could say, using the words of this passage, that we have captivated his heart, that he loves us and is committed to us as his church. And what greater demonstration of how much he loves us in that he was willing to leave his glory and come and enter this world, live as a human being, live as a servant, die on the cross. Not because he needed to, but because we needed him to. It's a measure of his love for us that he was willing to lay down his life for sinners. We need to be reminded that our Lord loves us. Uh, we need to know that Jesus loves us and that that's why he saved us, that we have that relationship with him to know that we are loved by our God, um, that he desires to serve us and to be with us and cares for us because he loves us. Um, I love a passage by William Still. Um, I probably have shared this with you before, but it's too late. I'm going to do it again. Um, he was talking once about preaching, and he said, I had been going at it one Sunday evening about living your whole life in Christ and for Christ. And one chap, he was Scottish. So one chap, because he thought that I must live my life on my knees, came to me wringing his hands because he was not being as holy as he thought he ought to be. I said to him, you foolish boy, do you think this means winding yourself up into a kind of robot existence? forever clicking your heels before a ruthless drill sergeant Christ? You have got it all wrong. You must learn that Christ is no mere censor, but a savior. This, Christ, this chap's Christ was a drill sergeant, and he thought that's what I was advocating. No, I was thinking of a Christ who would be with him when he went off the deep end and betrayed his fallen self and made an ass of himself and in private denied his own true holy nature. A Christ who was always kindly, always there, not to his sin, but to him. A Christ who was willing to be dragged to places 
and into thoughts he hated because he loved him and would not let him go. That's the kind of Christ we have, who loves us and will not let us go. And like the wonderful husband in the Song of Songs, Christ says to his church, come with me, enter into a new life with me together. I love you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Uh, he is a husband that any bride would gladly follow. So it's this wonderful picture, isn't it, um, that we have here. It's also a picture of delights that we're given in verses 12 through 15. The husband spoke of his love and desire to show care and concern for his bride as they enter into the consummation of their marriage. And then he talks about their physical union using the metaphors of a garden and of a fountain. Um, in the ancient world, we have to think about a garden. We're, we're probably helped by being Southern California people. So we know that gardens don't occur naturally in our part of the world. Um, if you try to keep up landscaping at your house, you know this. It doesn't happen naturally and without a lot of work and a lot of irrigation in this world. And their world was much like ours. A garden was a place that needed to be cultivated. You had to have the means to do it. It spoke of leisure and privilege and intimacy. Oftentimes great gardens were for kings and for the wealthy who could afford to keep them. Um, and it took deliberate work and activity to irrigate a garden, to maintain a garden. It was a lush retreat from everyday life that was kind of reserved for, for the rich and the, and the well-to-do. So gardens were a picture of happiness, a picture of privilege, something that was a joy to have. Um, and it was a wonderful thing if such a garden would be fed also by living water, not just by a well or a cistern, but a flowing spring that was perpetually feeding all of the plants. Uh, that's some of the glory that's described in Psalm 1 verse 3, that the righteous man is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Uh, gardens were private places exclusively, exclusively for the use of their owners. And that's what this, the husband is employing in speaking of his bride, that metaphor, that his bride is like a garden in the world uh, to him, and, and like no other garden that the world could have. Uh, again, we kind of have this loading up of the different kinds of things that are in this garden, and it's kind of a, a fantasy garden. It's a kind of garden that no person could keep, that to grow all of this stuff in it, uh, would be sort of beyond imagining for them to be able to have all of these fruit trees and all of these aromatic spices from around the world, from the common to the really exotic. It's something that no person would have a garden like this, not even a king. Um, it's a wonderful picture of diversity and glory that is in this, in this garden. It is a paradise. And that's how he's describing his wife. She is like this garden a garden that is fed by living water that wells up and flows down from the mountains, water that waters the plants of the garden and offers cool, refreshing water to drink, a fountain that never runs dry. This is what he thinks of his wife. This is how he thinks of her as a garden like this garden, um, a paradise of delights that are all fragrant and delicious. Uh, but he uses this garden metaphor also to show the, how his wife has protected her sexual purity and carefully reserved for marriage. Uh, to this point, it's been a locked garden. It's been a sealed fountain uh, waiting to be enjoyed by the one for whose use it has been designed by God, its maker, for this husband and this wife together. It's been locked against everyone else in the world because it was only intended for the two of them to use together in the bond of marriage. Um, and that's what this, this garden has been described as. To this point, it's been locked. It's been not for use. But now she's not a single woman. She's a bride. Now they are not merely beloved. They are husband and wife. And the time has come for them to enjoy this garden and fountain of delights together. And that's the picture of enjoyment that then really stands at the center of this book. Um, that we see in verse, in verse 16 of chapter 4 through 5, 1. Finally, the moment has come for the husband and the wife to enjoy the garden of delights in marriage that God has made for them. Um, and that explains where verse 16 starts. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden, 
and let its spices flow. What has been the, the note of reservation that's been said a couple times in this song? We have to wait until the day breathes. We have to wait until the day breathes. And what is he saying here? The day is breathing. It's that call for the winds to blow. It's the same word for the breathing day to blow upon the garden, for the winds to come. He's saying that thing that has been inaccessible for us, uh, that relationship that has yet to come together has now come together. Uh, the time has come as God has ordained it uh, for us to be together. Um, that's the entreaty of verse 16 that begins, and then there's this, this statement of response. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Um, we're really, really helped here in the ESV when it tells us who's speaking. Uh, this book is much harder to read if you don't have that help of who's speaking. Um, and I think it's right here to see at the end the bride speaking to her husband. Uh, he calls to her and she calls to him. Uh, there's mutuality in this. The husband refers to her as my garden. She refers to herself as my garden. Um, and, she refer and the way these references go now are very beautiful, right? Because her garden is only referred to as his at her invitation. And we see a really careful play on what's come in this song before. Um, he calls on those winds to awake. That's a word she's used before, not to let not to, not to stir up love, not to awaken love until it pleases. We've already said how the day breathes, that's a repeat. Um, and where she has previously warned against awakening love before its time, now when he gives this call to her, she reciprocates. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. Uh, the time has come. They have come to this moment of consummation. This garden that's been locked for them has been opened. This fountain that has been sealed has been opened. And it's for them to enjoy together. And the husband enters into the garden and enjoys all of the delights that have become his with her. Right? Verse 1, I came into to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Um, the garden has been enjoyed. They've come together. <coughs> Excuse me. When he described the garden, it was hers, your garden. And she invited him to her garden. Her invitation was, this is my garden. And then it becomes his garden in verse 1. It was hers. Now it's become his. Uh, she's given it to him uh, for them to enjoy together. It's at her invitation that this has become him, his. This is not a, a possession that he's taking possession of. It's a possession that he's been given as a gift by the one who loves him. <coughs> Excuse me, a, re a realization of her desire and his desire. And we know that this is all right and this is all proper because of what the others say. We haven't heard from the others in a while. Uh, the others are kind of the chorus in this text. It's not the husband or the wife speaking, it's the community speaking. The covenant community sort of bearing witness to all of this, and they have a wonderful encouragement to this couple. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Um, it's their celebration that everything here is right. Everything here is good. Everything here is to be celebrated. It's a really interesting thing for them to, for the Bible to say, be drunk, right? Because the Bible always says, don't be drunk. Uh, don't be drunk with wine. Uh, maybe, maybe, again, I don't know if you look at the titles of sermons, but if you look tonight and saw drunk with love, I don't know how you thought about that. Maybe until I read the text, uh, it's right here in the Bible, drunk with love. Um, but this is, this is their encouragement. Being drunk with wine is bad to be intoxicated, to have too much alcohol, right? Our popular euphemism for all our time is that person is overserved. You watch somebody at a baseball game stumbling between railings and people will say that person is overserved. Um, but what is the text beautifully saying here? You can't be overserved with love. 
it's a good gift from God that can't be overconsumed. And that's what these friends are celebrating. Everything about your relationship is to be celebrated. Everything in the garden is to be eaten. Everything in the garden is to be drunk. Everything in the garden is to be enjoyed. Go ahead and get drunk with love. There's no need to show any restraint. There's no need to love responsibly. In the sense that we say drink responsibly. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a gift. And why can it be indulged in like that without reservation, without concern about being overserved? Because it's a good gift that's been made by God. It's a good gift that's been given by God. And against such things, there is no law. There's no restraint to that. People need to know that when they fall in love and they get married, that God smiles upon that relationship. Um, he is pleased when we marry in the Lord, when we do what he has ordained in the world to do, including sex in marriage. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to be celebrated the way this covenant community celebrates it. It's recognized in that context as a wonderful gift from God. It's a reminder that God has made good and beautiful things for his people to enjoy. And it's a reminder if he's given us these good gifts, even in the midst of this fallen world, to enjoy how much greater are the things that await God's people in the consummation of the kingdom. If God knows how to make this world with all of its difficulties so beautiful and so wonderful for us, how much more is there in store for the people of God at the coming of our Lord? Um, there's a wonderful kingdom that awaits the people of God. Um, I like how one commentator put it. It's a longer quote, but we're almost at the end, so don't lose hope. What does he say? He says, above all Christians, look forward to the time of reunion. Above all, Christians look forward to the time of reunion with their Messiah and the full enjoyment, consummation of salvation, which is portrayed as a wedding feast of eating and drinking. This picture is not only consistent with that of God's first creation for humankind in the Garden of Eden, humanity also approaches it from time to time in the present life, despite the fallen condition of the world. It is found first and foremost in the joys of marriage. The erotic pleasures of sexual love are not a capitulation to sin. They are, instead are the most excellent sign in this world pointing to the joys that God has in store for those who love him. Here, as much as anywhere, the Song of Songs affirms that the physical world, though fallen, remains capable of redemption by God, and that it still contains something of the value and love he put into it. The world was created as something good to be enjoyed. Despite the absence of this experience for so many in a fallen world, that joy has not departed from the world. Sexual love in its proper context of committed love remains a sign of God's good world and those elements of it that remain forever. In this context, denial and sacrifice become an expression of love and commitment toward God, not by counting the world that God has created as bad, but by appreciating it as good. The surrender of what is good becomes acceptable only because it embraces a greater good and a greater beauty, the eternal bridegroom. And that's why we don't have to look at these passages if we're not married or if we've been married and we're no longer married or our, our spouse is no longer around. We, can't look at, we don't need to look at these things as if they're, they're pleasures that we could have had but don't have. I, I love that quote so much. It reminds us God gives us good things to give us a glimpse of how good the world to come will be. That even despite the fallenness of this world, the fallenness of the world has not ruined every evidence of the goodness of our God that exists. There still are flashes of it all over. Remnants and reminders of just how good God made the world and just how much he made it to be used and enjoyed. And we see that in marriage. 
We see that in creation. We see that in fellowship that we have with friends, with family. We see all around us the good reminders of the God who made this world and who's coming again to remake it and drive everything evil out of it. And I like that reminder that when we abstain from sexual intercourse because we're not married, we're not giving up a good thing or failing to go after something that's good. What we're actually pursuing is a higher good, the good which, which we were made for, to do things as God has called us to do and enjoy the joy that comes from knowing that we are pleasing God and that he's hearing He's seeing what we do, and we know that he's smiling upon what we do. It's not giving up something in order to gain nothing. It's not a net loss to do what God has called us to do. It's actually recognizing his good things and not wanting to make them something bad by what we do. It's a holding on to him. We want to do the things that God has called us to do as he's called us to do them. If you're married, then every aspect of the marriage relationship is to be enjoyed. Eat, drink, get drunk with love. That's the application of the sermon for you married people. Go out and eat and drink and be drunk with love. That's an application I think we can probably all get behind. Um, That's what's celebrated by the covenant community. And outside of that, These things are to be avoided because they are good things and because they are things that God has reserved for one kind of place. Um, And as with everything, if we look at this and see our failures, whether we failed to love as we ought inside of our marriages or whether we failed to love as we ought outside of marriage, there's hope for forgiveness in our God. Uh, That there is forgiveness of sins to those who seek him. That we don't have to be crippled under the burden of our past failures, but we can seek the Lord and find forgiveness of sins and hope for love from Him. What a wonderful foretaste that is of the spiritual goods that await us when the kingdom of God comes. And what a wonderful thing to know that that kingdom is coming and coming soon. If this world that's fallen is still so filled with the evidence of the goodness of our God, How much greater will the glory be when Jesus comes again? May he come quickly. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this reminder of the good gifts that you've given to us, including marriage and all of its aspects. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be thankful to you as the giver of every good and perfect gift that comes down to to us from you as the father of lights in whom there is no change or shadow of variation. We acknowledge that everything good in this world comes from your hand, that it was made to be enjoyed, and to the extent it's been corrupted, that's been all of our faults. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sins. And But as we look around this world, despite its fallenness, help us to see the testimonies to your glory that we see in the beauty of your creation, that we see in the beauty of marriage, and help us to appreciate the good things that you have made to be enjoyed and to look forward to those greater things that await us at the return of our Savior, how we look forward to enjoying glory and being drunk with love in heaven with you and your Son. Hear us and help us, for we pray in his name. Amen. As our song of response, let's take up our psalters and turn to 103E. O come, my soul, bless thou the Lord. We'll stand together and sing all the verses of 103E.
Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Thank you.